This episode of Distraction is sponsored by Landmark College. Try their free comparison tool for colleges with learning disability support at lcdistraction.org. Landmark College. Learn your way. Succeed uniquely. With the right treatment, um, your life can change. I know that mine changed when I was diagnosed and treated uh, to such an extreme that that's why I wanted to be out there helping other women. I can see uh, how quickly and how wonderfully women can improve their lives. Hello, this is Dr. Ned Hallowell for the podcast Distraction. Today we're going to devote the episode to women and ADHD. And, uh, you know, when I first learned about what was then called ADD in 1981, I was taught that the ratio of males to females was 10 to 1, 10 males for every one female. Uh, That's because we weren't catching on to the fact that girls and women usually don't have hyperactivity, aren't disruptive. Quite the contrary, they're the quiet daydreamer sitting in the back of the room staring out the window. And they were passed over or dismissed as not very bright or maybe depressed, uh, but they didn't get their ADHD diagnosed. Well, thankfully, that has changed in the ensuing however many years is 1981 ago. <laughs> and and one of the leaders in uh, the field today and, and uh, of helping women with ADHD is my longtime friend Terry Matlin, one of the kindest women you'll ever meet as well as one of the smartest. She's by training uh, an MSW social worker uh, and uh, she's also a psychotherapist, a writer, a coach, a consultant. Her books, plural, The Queen of Distraction and Survival Tips for Women with ADHD, I recommend very highly. So we're... Really lucky to have Terry with us today, and uh, we received a bunch of questions from our listeners, Uh, and thank you, by the way, for writing in with your questions. All right, with that introduction, let me bring Terry onto the line, and uh, welcome, Terry. Hello, Ned. Thank you so much for inviting me (laughs) onto your very popular podcast. I'm thrilled to be here. It's wonderful, wonderful to have you. So how did you get into this line of work? How did a nice girl like you find yourself (laughs) in a place like this? (laughs) Well, I have two daughters, and my youngest daughter was diagnosed with ADHD at a very young age. Her story is pretty unique, so I'm not going to get into it, but it's not the typical story of She was born with ADHD, she -hmm. had trouble with school, and then all that sort of thing. But suffice it to say that um, in trying to help her, oh, I'd say from the time she was about four, um, I was learning about ADHD in kids. How can I help? Here I am, a social worker. How do I help this kid who was totally out of control with severe hyperactivity and impulsivity? So along the way, as I uh, was reading and reading and reading, in those days, as you know, Ned, this would be early 1990s, there weren't a lot of books out on ADHD in kids, let alone ADHD in adults. So Mm -hmm. I was reading and somehow I came across uh, a book, the only book in the early 90s, I believe, that was out there. And then I read that and uh, came across your book, Mm -hmm. which has changed millions of people, which um, changed my life dramatically. So that's driven to distraction. And reading your book, I'm not quite sure why I picked it up, because it was really more about adults, and I didn't even think I might have ADHD. I just thought I was quirky, that (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't get my life together. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was because I had two very active kids, one with the uh, ADHD, but your book really changed my life. And so I read more. As the years went on, more books came out. But yours really is the Bible. Um, And then I got um, evaluated by a local psychologist who happened to specialize in ADHD in adults. And when I was diagnosed and treated for my ADHD, this is back, gosh, over 20, over 25 years ago, Mm. I saw how much it changed my life for the better. I never went through the stages that we talk about that many with ADHD do go through with uh, things like um, grief and loss and anger and all those sorts of things. I took it and I ran with it 
because of how positive um, it was for my life. Mm -hmm. And when I saw how wonderful, uh, you know, my life became, not, you know, bed of roses wonderful, but it changed significantly. Mm -hmm. I wanted to help other adults with ADHD, and that's how I landed in the field of ADHD. Mm. Well, thank goodness you did. And and then... uh you wrote the books, and then you got you have a very robust online presence as well. Yeah, what happened was I got involved even before the books were written. I got involved with nonprofit organizations like Chad mm-hmm. and Ada, and I was very active on their boards. So what happened was people were emailing me from all over the world, mm. and I thought, well, how can I help people who are in Africa or uh, Sweden and Canada, U.S.? Right. So I took everything online. And started my website at addconsults.com, but still I, I needed more outreach because mm-hmm. I wasn't giving people what they needed. And because of my passion, like yours, you know, I was thinking, what else can I do? What right. else can I do? I'm not more, much of a podcast kind of person. So uh-huh. I started a bunch of groups on Facebook because Facebook had gotten extremely popular. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I focused more of my work for women with ADHD. So I have one group on Facebook for women that has over 22,000 Members. Wow. So I really have taken to social media because I think that's one way that a lot of people can find what you call vitamin C connection right. online. Right. If someone wants to look into those, how do they do it? If they want to get to um, the women's group on Facebook, the uh, URL is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash women with ADD. And if that gets to be too confusing, uh, folks can just email me, and I can send them in the right direction. My my email address is Terry, T E R R Y at a d d consults dot com. And that'll take them to your groups. That'll take them to that group. I have another group for yeah. specifically for moms with A D D, and what's I don't that have one? that in front of me. But I have all kinds of Facebook groups to cover a lot of my bases. So I have one for let's say, um, for professionals who have ADD. They have their Uh, own uh. group of problems that uh, they feel misunderstood. So uh, there's all kinds of Facebook groups that I run, but this one is the biggest, the one for women. It's just gone crazy. I've um, I've gotten about between 25 and 100 people a day who are trying to join. So what what happens? You see so you're in the group. What how does it work? Well, it's like a support group. Yeah. I don't spend a lot of time in the group. I have a large group of volunteers who moderate things to make sure everything stays calm. Yeah. Because imagine being in a room with 22,000 women, right. <laughs> women with ADHD. I can't quite handle it myself. So so do people just post comments? Yeah, they post comments. Uh-huh. A lot of it has to do with, you know, have you experienced this? Am I the only one who right. can't handle a conversation at a party? Right. And then other women will jump in and say, no, you're not the only one. I have the same problem. Wonderful. So what it does is it it validates people's experiences. That's wonderful. So it's become a successful business for you. Yeah, and that's been a really great outcome of embracing my ADHD. Yes, yes. And I think that's an important message for not just women, but men and women. Absolutely. That you get to a stage, hopefully, in your journey with your ADHD, that you can embrace it and take it and run it. Use the qualities that are positive and use them to your advantage. Well, you know, uh, Tim Armstrong, have you ever heard of the company called Oath? No. Okay. Oath is the result of the merger of Verizon, AOL, and Yahoo. Oh, okay. So the those huge companies uh, merged into one called Oath, and Tim Armstrong is their CEO. And He and I have become friends because – he and his wife and I have become friends because Tim has big-time ADD. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's very proud of it, very open about it. And he is committed to funding and making a documentary with me and and his wife based on just what you were saying, the strength-based approach, that, that you'll get the best outcome if you own it, embrace it, and manage it as opposed to hiding it and um uh, we all know what a ter- what the terrible outcomes that can result sure. if you if you don't take it seriously. But Tim is is going to make this wonderful documentary, and and uh, I think Terry, it's a real chance for finally the cloud of stigma to you know be blown away. You know, and and you know some people misunderstand what people like you and me are saying. We're not saying 
ADD can't be a severe problem. It sure can. It can be horrible. Mm -hmm. Lives can be ruined. But at the same time, if you learn how to manage it right, it can turn into a tremendous asset. And, uh, well, that's what it did for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, learned, you know, what what I'm good at. I learned what I'm not good at. Yep, yep. I learned to use what I call accommodations, yep. just like we use for kids in school who yep. have uh, special needs in a learning environment. And I bring that into the adult stage of well, yeah, you have a problem with keeping your house together. You have a problem getting your work done yep. at your job. Then you bring in an accommodation, and I. Uh, emphasize that it's not a luxury. It's not a luxury right. to, to have some uh, cleaning crew come into your home because it might take you 10 days to do what a cleaning crew <laughs> right. can do in one hour. Right. <laughs> and a lot of women feel absolutely horrible yes. about asking for that kind of help when yes. I reframe it as, no, it's not a weakness yeah, at all. Any more than eyeglasses are a weakness. Exactly. You know, so it's, uh, it's smart. It's called working smart right. instead of just working hard. We'll be back with more from Distraction Podcast right after this word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Relationships take work. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about and treat them well. But how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? This month, our sponsor, BetterHelp Online Therapy, wants to remind you to take care of your most important relationship, the one you have with yourself. BetterHelp Online Therapy offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. BetterHelp is easy, affordable, and it can be life-changing. You can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Distraction Podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash distraction. Don't wait. Change things for the better. Go to betterhelp.com slash distraction now. You'll be glad you did. Well, we've received a bunch of questions from our listeners, and uh, I thought rather than me answering them, it would be really nice for you to answer them. But before that, we want to take just a moment to hear from our wonderful sponsor, Landmark College. You know, when I was growing up, there weren't many options for students like me, students who learn differently. Uh, basically, we had two diagnoses, smart and stupid, and one treatment plan, try harder. And they'd get you to try harder by punishing you and shaming you. It was, it was a pretty primitive system. Uh, having ADD and dyslexia, which didn't have names back then, uh, it made learning a challenge. But as I've mentioned on the show before, I was lucky. I had a first grade teacher by the name of Mrs. Eldridge, who, whom I've talked about many times, who helped me simply by putting her arm around me. She didn't excuse me from reading, but she made uh, the classroom experience without fear, without shame. It was okay to be who I was. I may never have learned how to read were it not for Mrs. Eldridge. I'm still a very slow reader. I have dyslexia, but I'm not the least bit ashamed of it. I majored in English at Harvard, you know, and, and did pre-med. So I'm, I'm a slow reader. So what? I can read. That's what matters. And that's one of the things I love about the sponsor of our show, Landmark College in Putney, Vermont. It's a college full of teachers like my dear old Mrs. Eldridge. They uncover how each student learns best, and then they create an environment to help that student succeed. They truly do teach differently. For those of us who learn differently, we need that. And I couldn't recommend this school more highly for students with ADHD, ASD, other learning differences, or really any kind of brain. To learn more about Landmark College, go to lcdistraction.org. That's lcdistraction.org. And now, back to the show. Okay, uh, so I'm here with my wonderful friend, uh, the expert on ADD, Terry Matlin. 
And we're about to answer some questions from our listeners. And again, thank you so much for sending these questions to us about women and ADHD, or as Terry and I still call it, ADD. Our producer, Sarah Gurton, is in the studio with me now, and she's here to read the questions we received from listeners. Terry, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's go to our first question. Okay. Hello, everyone. This first question we got uh, comes from Lauren C. in Maryland, and she writes, I am 31 years old and was diagnosed with ADD and anxiety at the end of last year after struggling primarily with activation and focus my whole life. Since the diagnosis, I have been on Adderall and Zoloft. They are working really well, and I am seeing an ADHD coach to improve on habits the medication hasn't resolved. My question is this. My husband and I are interested in conceiving this year, and I am most concerned about stopping my stimulant medication while pregnant. My main concern is that I will have to endure a year or so of distraction during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Do you have any suggestions for supplements or other medications for ADD that are safe for mom and baby? Well, I'm going to answer part of it, but I'm going to also defer to Ned because he's the MD on this team. First of all, um, a lot of women find that during their pregnancy, their ADD symptoms improve, and that has to do with the estrogen levels changing. And uh, Ned, you might be able to explain why that is. But before that, uh, a couple of tips to help you, Lauren from Maryland is to consider exercise. I know that you'll have to check with your doctor to see what kind of exercise will be beneficial and what will be safe for you during your pregnancy because obviously uh, towards the end you'll want to be careful with that. But there are studies out that show that exercise can be extremely helpful in taming ADHD symptoms. So I I uh, I know that swimming, a lot of women say that swimming has been extremely helpful with their ADD symptoms and safe for their their months in their pregnancy. Also, prenatal yoga classes, they're out there now. They're all over the place, and that can help with your um, focus and calming you down if you have the, um, the hyperactive impulsive component to your ADD. That's an excellent uh, option for you. I've heard things about neural feedback. Uh, Dr. Hallowell can probably address that better than I can. What I found, um, just in general, is meditation. Meditation can calm your mind. So that would be something to, to look into during the pregnancy. There are brain training courses that uh, will be safe for you during your pregnancy. Again, Ned, I think you can address that better than me. And you mentioned in your question that you're working with a coach, and I say bravo. That, um, that would be a huge help, not only throughout your pregnancy, but uh, now and after you have your child because we find that working with an ADD coach is like working with a second brain. Uh, They help us with the executive functioning that we often lack as adults with ADHD. So I would hope that you continue working with your coach to help you get through um, some of these things. Also maybe working with a CBT cognitive behavioral therapist. They often can help you with some of the aspects of living with ADHD that can be uh, problematic. So I think those are some of the main things that I think could help you, but also keep it in mind that you may find that while you're uh, pregnant that your symptoms may actually improve. Yeah, just to reinforce that, uh, pregnancy is a good treatment for ADD, so you may not miss your medications much at all. I would advise you not to take any, any medications during pregnancy at all. As for supplements, uh, obviously talk to your doctor but fish oil is a is a real good one. Uh, we like Omega Bright the best. O m e g a hyphen b r i t e. Order it online. Fish oil is a real good good supplement. But talk to your doctor before you ingest anything. Uh, and I would I would stay off the ADD meds. And pregnancy may take care of it. And absolutely echo what Terry said about meditation, physical exercise, um, yoga. Wonderful. Coaching is absolutely wonderful, whether you're pregnant or not. Uh, but if you, you work with that, work with that coach. The uh, brain training stuff. I, I don't think we're there yet. Best way is just to use your brain, and uh, with uh, stimulating conversations, uh, reading a book, crossword puzzles, uh, and neurofeedback. Uh, I don't, you know, for ADD. Uh, 
I don't think we're we're quite there yet either. For trauma, yes, Bessel van der Kolk is a big proponent of uh, neurofeedback for trauma. But uh, I, th- I think the ones that Terry ticked off are plenty and enough. We'll be back with more from Distraction Podcast right after this word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Relationships take work. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about and treat them well. But how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? This month, our sponsor, BetterHelp Online Therapy, wants to remind you to take care of your most important relationship, the one you have with yourself. BetterHelp Online Therapy offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. BetterHelp is easy, affordable, and it can be life-changing. You can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Distraction Podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash distraction. Don't wait. Change things for the better. Go to betterhelp dot com slash distraction now. You'll be glad you did. Now, here are two questions that, from two different listeners, but they kind of go together. Is there any evidence on how hormone changes impact the symptoms of ADHD? For example, many young women take hormonal birth control. Could this cause problems with our ADHD symptoms and or stimulant medication? Regards, Monique. And then Jane asked, I read that the effect of ADD on a woman may change with hormonal changes, such as puberty or later menopause. I heard that it could help to have your hormone levels tested if, like me, you're in your late 30s or 40s. Do you think there is a hormonal element? Absolutely. Um, In the work I do, which is probably 99% with women, this is what I'm hearing from puberty on to postmenopausal stages of life. Hormones have a huge, huge effect on symptoms in women. And I think that we're not doing enough work in explaining this to women because uh, they're coming to me distraught at these different areas, different times in their lives. Like, why am I getting worse? Am I developing Alzheimer's? These are the uh, perimenopausal, postmenopausal women. And even in the younger women um, going through puberty, there's a change in hormones, obviously, with, uh, with, with that. And because of these changes in hormones, we see an increase in... ADHD symptoms. So we first need to really learn about this. And there is literature um, online. Actually, I have a chapter in my book on hormones and women with ADHD. It's very, very important to understand yourself. So during all these phases of life, you'll see a change, often for the worse. I hate to say it, but it's not for, you know, not every woman has a terrible time with hormonal changes, but we do see fluctuation in how they affect symptomology. So one thing that I would recommend, even though it wasn't really asked, but I'm going to offer it anyway, is to start like a journal. When do you feel best? When do you feel worse? Is it two weeks before your period? Is it uh, during your period? Is it um, as you're entering perimenopause when your estrogen levels drop? Is it uh, certain times during your pregnancy that we kind of alluded to? is to really start tracking this down and taking this information to your psychiatrist, but also to your OBGYN because there are ways to help you during these times in your life when you are struggling. So absolutely, these uh, changes in hormones will often affect how you manage your ADHD, but there are ways to work with it uh, for some women, and again, Ned can address this better than me, for some women it might be adding uh, anti-anxiety or uh, anti-depression medications during times of change. It can be hormone replacement. Uh, Dr. Patricia Quinn talks a lot about using um, hormone treatment, especially during menopause, perimenopause, to help with some of the cognitive changes. Uh, I get emails all the time from women who really do think they're losing it that they're developing dementia at 40, 45, 50. And we know that statistically that's probably not the case, that it's more likely the ADHD um, that is affecting you because of the changes in your estrogen levels. 
So absolutely, it's a great question. It's something that women really do need to better understand so that they can take proactive uh, action in helping themselves. So, Ned, if you have some more specifics about... No, no, you <laughs> covered it very well, Terry. You know, absolutely. And work with OBGYN, internal medicine, endocrinology, uh, take the hormone seriously and make the uh, proper adjustments. The next question. Does it appear that women with ADHD are more isolated socially, regardless of treatment? Growing up, I was the only girl I knew diagnosed, and I was more tolerated than accepted. That carried into adulthood, and I was in my 30s before I met another woman with ADHD. I find now that the more I open up about it, the more ADHD women I find. Thank you, Sabrina. Hi, Sabrina. If you're listening to this, your story is not the only story that I've heard like this. And I think there's a number of reasons why women with ADHD feel more socially isolated regardless of treatment. And I think it has partly to do with how girls are, how girls grow up. And this is from the work from Sari Solden that is a colleague of uh, Ned's and, and mine. And she talks about how girls are taught very, very early on what society's expectations are of girls and women in this world, whether you have ADHD or not. But You know, we're taught that we're supposed to carry um, a lot of responsibility for keeping the family together, putting meals on the table, having um, holiday dinners, and just, you know, making the doctor and dental appointments for our kids. It's really holding the, the family together. I think that's changed a bit, and men are definitely taking on more of the responsibility, but I think girls are still taught from the time they're little by their mothers, and even in um, ways that we're not aware of through media, that this is how girls behave, this is how girls carry on as adult women. So if you feel that you're falling short because you have an ADHD brain and you're 30 years old and you just can't juggle all of these responsibilities, what's going to happen is you're often going to feel like you're different, that you're out of step, that there's something wrong with you, there's something off. And that, of course, can lead into symptoms of depression and anxiety and even substance abuse. So this feeling socially isolated, I think, comes from a long history of girls hearing this message and then, you know, feeling that they don't measure up because we're constantly comparing ourselves to our sisters, our mothers, our neighbors, our girlfriends who may have it more together because they don't have the challenge of living with this ADHD brain. So I think it really comes from a very early experience that just continues, and especially if if you're late in getting diagnosed and late in getting treatment, uh, that can just be a huge part of your, your life. And that, again, um, can change. With the right treatment, um, your life can change. I know that mine changed when I was diagnosed and treated uh, to such an extreme that that's why I wanted to be out there helping other women. I can see Uh, how quickly and how wonderfully women can improve their lives. So it's not a lost cause. There's another piece to this that I think that's important, and that is a lot of women and men, it's not, uh, you know, dependent on on your gender, um, have problems with social, you know, social situations. We don't always read social things appropriately or correctly. That there's a number of reasons for that, and there's ways to get help with that. So Learning to listen in in more proactive ways um, can help with feeling more socially uh, in tune with with other people. There's a really good book out there, Ned. I don't know if you've read it. Uh, Michelle, Dr. Michelle Navani, another colleague of ours, wrote this book a number of years ago, but it's still a fantastic book to read. And it's titled, uh, What Does Everybody Know That I Don't? Mm. And she specifically gets into this feeling of being out of step and how you can relate better to people around you. And once you learn some of these tricks or whatever you want to call them, Mm -hmm. then you'll find that you're not as socially isolated because now you have a toolbox of, well, how do I say hello to people? When Mm -hmm. do I stop talking? When do I start talking? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, it's finding connections. You know, Dr. Howell talks about this all the time, the vitamin C. And as we talked about earlier, finding groups of other women with ADHD so you can see that you're not alone and, uh, you know, finding me on Facebook or wherever online, reading books on women with ADHD, going to conferences. We didn't really mention Chad and Ada put on fabulous conferences where you can connect with 
women uh, who have ADHD. And that was also life altering for me when I found people like me you know, losing things, dropping things, forgetting names after I just met someone was just life changing. So connection is the key. And, and go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash women with ADD and you'll get into Terry's group of, of, of adult women who, who have ADD and, uh, you know, 20,000 members. Uh, you, you'll get a lot of a lot of support and a lot of knowledge and pooled, uh, you know, the vitamin connect, as I say, you know, is, is the best the best thing going. And now you can get it online uh, again, Facebook dot com forward slash groups forward slash women with ADD to join Terry's group. Okay, here's another question from Sabrina. Does it appear that women with ADHD have an increased risk of becoming involved in an either toxic or abusive relationship? Is this more attributable to the ADHD brain overthinking the reasons to justify abusive behavior, or is it more societal norm-driven? You mentioned during your How to ADHD interview last year, Dr. Hallowell, that we are attracted to train wrecks. She quotes, and after coming out of narcissistic abuse, I cannot think of a possible bigger train wreck than an abuser. Well, I think that uh, I love that quote of the uh, being attracted to train wrecks is so true because the ADD brain is always searching for stimulation, stimuli. And being in an abusive relationship certainly does spark that part of our brain that is searching for the train wreck. Uh, but I think there's more to it than that. Um, I think it's also ha- I think it has to do with a lot of adults with ADHD have very poor self-esteem. So we um, might be attracted to people who may not be the healthiest match for us. <clears throat> if I'm losing my voice, it's because I'm here in Michigan, where <clears throat> the weather keeps changing from 40 degrees to below zero. <laughs> <laughs> That's a train wreck. If you want to you know, enjoy that kind of abuse, <laughs> but. Yeah, I think it's a combination of, of looking for, for simulation of the ADD brain, but also growing up with a feeling of a lack of self-esteem. Like if you've been uh, in, your, in your own mind, uh, you're perceived as someone who has failed in many areas of your life. You haven't gotten the right treatment. You haven't gotten the right support. You haven't had a great relationship perhaps with your parents or your teachers in school with peers then it kind of sets you up for continuing that type of behavior in your adult relationships, um, romantic relationships. So it's, it's something that needs to be broken. And the way to break that is to get the appropriate treatment, seeing a therapist who can walk through your life with you and look at the different uh, things that you've done over, over a lifetime and how to break that. And working on your self-esteem and talking about the things that you do well and and focusing on that and putting your energy into the good stuff. So I think it is a combination of of those two things. I'd add a third reason. Uh, Most people with ADD are remarkably intuitive and remarkably generous. And so they see into these train wrecks and and believe they can help them and uh, save them. And 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 so they go ahead and do it because they're they're so generous. So uh, uh, it, it's not a good idea. That's one time where you want to you know hold back on your your instinct to save you. You probably do understand the person, uh, but it usually does not work. It usually when you become intimate with a train wreck, uh, usually you get hurt. Uh, the other person doesn't get saved. So, uh, but I completely agree with Terry on, on the other the other two reasons. And and to get a coach, a therapist, uh, someone to help you put on the brakes uh, or get out of the relationship if you're if you're already in it, and and uh, you know find a healthy relationship, which is which is really great when you do it. Well, my sincere thanks to Terry for joining me today. We'll continue this conversation next time when we'll answer more of the questions that you listeners have sent in to us about women and ADHD. So, Terry, until next week. I am so looking forward to continuing our conversation, Ned, on this very, very important topic. Thank you so much for having me as your guest. Thank you. Well, my sincere thanks to Terry for joining me today. 
We'll continue this conversation next time when we'll answer more of the questions that you listeners have sent in to us about women and ADHD. Uh, it's so great to hear Terry's thoughts and to hear her. I mean, you can just hear in her voice what a calming, wise woman she is. It's, uh, it's, it's really fun for me to listen and know, you know, the knowledge she's imparting is, comes, comes wrapped in kindness and experience. If you'd like to learn more about Terry Matlin and her work, just click the link in the episode description or go directly to her website, ADD Consults, that's plural, addconsults.com. Remember, please, to leave a rating and a review for distraction on Apple Podcasts. We really benefit from those ratings and reviews. We love hearing your thoughts about the show and your reviews help us get new listeners, building the community we're trying to build. So we really, really appreciate them. Distraction is produced by Collisions, the podcast division of CRN International. Collisions, podcasts for curious people. Our audio engineer is the brilliant Scott Person. Our original music theme was created by the invisible Mark Berman. And our producer is the inimitable, brilliant, creative Sarah Curtin. <laughs>